Okay, if you're just joining us, we are about to start today's webinar, Gaza Reconstruction, More Than a Humanitarian Project. We're gonna give this just a couple of seconds for people to join us in the Zoom room, so bear with us. If you are here for the Gaza Reconstruction webinar, you're in the right place. Uh, we will be starting in roughly 30 seconds. All right, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and start with the introductions. Welcome everyone and good morning. I'm Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Welcome to our webinar today entitled Gaza Reconstruction, More Than a Humanitarian Project. Now, just some quick background. Um, most of the audience probably knows this, but I wanna run through it. Last month uh, from May 10th to 21st, Israeli military operations against the Gaza Strip which of course took place in the context of a wider conflict, which included Hamas and Islamic Jihad shooting rockets from Gaza into Israel. Um, but this military operation killed at least 256 Palestinians, at least half of whom were civilians, including 65 children, 66 children, and wounded at least 2,000 Palestinians. Inside Israel, Hamas attack killed 13 people, including two children. The military operations in Gaza resulted in widespread destruction inside Gaza, including hundreds of homes, several high-rise residential buildings, and roads and infrastructure. To get a sense of the scope of the devastation, um, I recommend people look at the report published last week in the Washington Post, which was entitled, The Toll of Israeli Strikes <clears throat> on Gaza, Mapping the Destruction Left Behind. I think my colleague will put a link to that into the chat box. That piece includes an incredibly helpful and harrowing uh, map documenting the destruction across the whole of the Gaza Strip. In the aftermath of this destruction, the international community is once again debating how to quote unquote, rebuild Gaza. But as in past rounds of intervention in the wake of Israeli military operations in Gaza, that debate seems to be limited largely to humanitarian concerns. This approach treats the Gaza Strip in effect like an island that tragically keeps getting hit by natural disasters rather than what it is, which is one of the most densely populated places in the world, kept under a harsh blockade for years and years and years imposed by a powerful neighboring nation. So while addressing urgent humanitarian concerns is clearly an imperative, the logic behind another round of international intervention geared merely to restoring the situation in the Gaza Strip to as close as possible to what was a deeply problematic status quo ante is unclear. In this context, the question has to be asked, what does the Gaza Strip really need? Uh, what do people really want? And what can the international community do? And frankly, what does the international community have an obligation to do to help? And lastly, where do accountability mechanisms fit in? These are all part of the same set of questions. And lastly, really wrapping it all up, what will it take for the international community to shift from treating the humanitarian symptoms in the Gaza Strip to engaging to address the underlying dynamics that are at the root of what ails Gaza? So with that as background, graciously giving us their time to help us understand these issues and more, we are very pleased to be joined today by two experts on the Gaza Strip. Uh, first, we have Issam Yunus. Uh, Issam is joining us from Gaza. He is the director of Al Mizan Center for Human Rights in Gaza. He is the Commissioner General of the Palestinian Independent Commission for Human Rights, ICHR. He is also the president of the Arab Network of National Human Rights Institutions and a member of the Palestinian Higher Education Council and a policy advisor for Ashebeka. Uh, we also have Tanya Hari. Tanya is joining us from, are you in Jaffa or Tel Aviv? I'm in Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv okay. um, where she is the executive director of Gisha, the Legal Center for Freedom of Movement, an Israeli human rights organization which promotes the right to movement in the Palestinian territory, especially Gaza. Leading Israel's only organization focused on Gaza, Israel, Tanya is relied upon as a source of information and analysis on the situation in the Gaza Strip, both at home and abroad. And she appeared before the UN Security Council in 2015 and 2019 to talk about what's happening in Gaza. You can find their much fuller and extremely impressive bios on the FMEP website, www.fmep.org. And my colleagues will be putting links to their Twitter handles, their websites, and other things into the chat box, I think, as we speak. So some housekeeping before we begin, as is our normal practice on these webinars, the format today will be a discussion between myself and the panelists. In addition to my own questions, I welcome audience questions submitted via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. Put your questions there. Do not 
put them in the chat box. I won't see them, and I will put as I will, I will factor as many of your questions into my questions and as we go forward. Uh, also during the webinar, keep an eye on the chat box because my colleagues Sarah Ann and Kristen will be putting links to resources that come up into the chat box. And if you miss anything, it'll all be on the website along with the video of this event, which last thing is being recorded and live streamed. It'll be on our website. It's being live streamed on Facebook. Feel free to share it and invite your colleagues, all of that. So let's dive in. Isama, I want to start with you. The latest war ended a little over three weeks ago. And by all accounts, uh, life inside Israel has basically returned to normal. Inside the Gaza Strip, of course, the situation is very different. And I want to start by asking you to tell us what the situation is like there right now. And this really includes talking to us about the scale and nature of the destruction. Um, houses, schools, health services, roads, electricity, drinking water, all of that. Thank you, Laura. Um... Uh, I really appreciate uh, the FMEP for this uh, uh, webinar, for uh, inviting me and uh, Tanya uh, for, uh, uh, to, to address uh, uh, people on, on uh, situation now uh, in that part of the world. I'll add just a couple of uh, uh, words regarding Gaza um, before I address the current situation. Gaza is a unique situation, uh, 360 kilometers, uh, alongside the Mediterranean, surrounded by Israel from north and east, and from the, by Egypt from the, the, the south. Uh, 306 square kilometers, the inhabitants 2.2 million. It's very unique. Uh, nature is very arbitrary with Gaza, uh, with this very tough uh, 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 geography. But Gaza, uh, and here the uniqueness stems from the fact that first, it's unpredictable. Uh, and predictable situation, it's very difficult to predict how things might be in two hours for different reasons. Uh, we could speak on this later on, maybe today. Uh, uh, second, it's, and that's why we, we, we cannot plan at all. Uh, uh, on a daily basis, we are faced with developments on the ground that might turn the table upside down. Uh, second, it's very fragile. Uh, uh, Gaza is, is dependent on, on others. And, and uh, the whole, the, the, I mean, 75% of Gazans are refugees. Uh, and according to OCHA figures, recent figures, that's 85, this is before the recent offensive, by the way, 85% uh, uh, of Gazans are directly dependent on humanitarian aid provided by uh, humanitarian agencies. Uh, and not only Gaza, which is dependent, the PA, the idea of creating the PA was created to be intentionally dependent on others, politically and financially. And there are many examples that might be invoked later on today. And then, which is, I believe, is unique and unprecedented anywhere, uh, in, in, in Washington, you have a citizen versus her government. Here we have many who are responsible for the good and the bad. Gaza is an occupied territory before Oslo and after, before the United States engagement by Israel in 2005 and after, and definitely before uh, uh, the taking over of Gaza by Hamas and after that. And Gaza is part of the occupied territories, and Israel is the principal. Uh, party when it comes to the good and the bad, the human rights. I'm not giving portions, but just for the sake of the argument to have sort of autopsy before we address the, the current situation. And then we have two governments, internally speaking, the PA, which is a legitimate government, if you like, and de facto authority in Gaza, which is Hamas. And the two has their own portions when it comes to uh, uh, our, our talk. And we have the international community, the fourth, the fourth party. And the national community was part of the good and the bad. Good conditions, principles of the quartet, give peace a chance for the last three decades and how it has been ended with this harvest. I believe harvest of sins, we, there are many, many obligations on, on, on international community that uh, have by the end of the day resulted in, 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 in what's going on. So they are part of, the, compared with Arab conflicts, they are not a mediator, they are part of. This is important to, to highlight. In addition to many non-state actors, who knows, they might occupy the sea in some day, but they, they are there. So this is the, the situation in general in Gaza. The recent one, recent offensive, the recent aggression by Israel, have again uh, uh, resulted in huge destruction in Gaza. And I'll just, because I don't take much of the time of uh, my colleague, uh, Tanya, and, uh, 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 just to, to give you uh, an update of, of, the, uh, of the figures and facts that uh, were collected uh, uh, and based on our documentation, because still ongoing process, it's not finished yet. 
I mean, to go to everywhere. And our work as a human rights organization, not only we, Gisha, we, and other Israeli and the human rights organization, we, we rely on, on, we have to, to, to uh, approach victims and to have the first hand information from victims or eyewitnesses directly and not to rely on hearsay kind of work. So we, we, we have to be uh, uh, as credible as possible and uh, to meet the people. That's why it, it takes time to have final, final figures. But the huge destruction that was left in Gaza was quite significant, this time in the heart of Gaza and Rimal area, the, 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 uh, the heart of Gaza city. Uh, was subjected to, uh, mm, you know, uh, uh, huge uh, destruction, uh, uh, targeting by by the Israeli uh, fighter jets. Uh, uh, when 150 uh, war jets just uh, occupied the the the, the, uh, the airspace of Gaza and bombarded uh, in in 10 minutes uh, uh, in, in in the heart of the Gaza City, has resulted uh, the 11 days uh, of the killing of 260. Uh, 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 people, 67 of them are children, 41 uh, uh, women, three out of them are uh, of disabilities. Uh, uh, the, the numbers who were injured were 1,981, 1, uh, uh, amongst them 643 children and 399 uh, um, women, 44% uh, 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 which are 116 who were killed amongst the 260 were killed inside their homes uh, uh, without prior notification. Uh, amongst them were 44 children and 36 uh, uh, women. 19 families uh, have lost uh, uh, between two family members to 22 family members and many families uh, uh, lost all their uh, uh, members except one who survived. 80% uh, 80, 80 of the attacks took place that has resulted in the, in the, in the killings of uh, or injuries of civilians uh, and, and uh, I mean, uh, in general, who were killed uh, was actually executed uh, uh, from around uh, 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 5 p.m. until 5 a.m. So most of those who were killed were killed during night, 80% uh, out of them. Now, according to our documentation, which might be different from for, uh, official sources or other sources, uh, uh, the numbers that we, we uh, have access to, and uh, I think it's uh, based on, on the methodology that we use, uh, 500 housing units were completely destroyed and uh, uh, 5,000 uh, uh, ha other housing units were partially uh, uh, destroyed. 10 multi-story buildings, towers uh, uh, were, four, uh, I mean, four, four, four towers out of those 10 multi-story buildings, high multi-story buildings, were completely uh, destroyed. al shuruq uh, Al-Jala, where the AP and Al-Jazeera uh, uh, have their offices there. Uh, the, the, uh, the attacks uh, also has resulted in the uh, internal displacement of 60,000 uh, 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 citizens. Uh, and now uh, uh, there are 8,500 8, who are, have not, has not yet been uh, returned back to their homes because their homes were destroyed. Some uh, 270 uh, out of those 8,500 8, who still uh, IDPs uh, uh, are still in two honor war schools. So compared with the war, uh, the offensive in 2014, the numbers are less and the destruction is definitely lesser because at that time, you know, areas, quarterhoods have been uh, 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 destroyed and eliminated from the map, like Shija'iyah and, and uh, I mean, the eastern and, and northern parts of, of Gaza. Uh, now with the uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, 18 uh, sewage pumps have, have been uh, uh, damaged. Uh, some 18,734 meters of uh, uh, sewage network uh, has been uh, damaged. Uh, uh, in electricity, as you know, 69 percent uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a deficit of 69 percent at the moment, uh, where we have uh, today became, yesterday it was eight hours. 
during the offensive were four hours of supply of electricity. Uh, today it became 10 hours uh, 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 or two, no, 14 hours of, of, of cuts and six or four hours, four to six hours of, of supply. Uh, because of, the, of this, because Gaza is still under the blockade, under blockade. Uh, and the blockade, as you uh, uh, just put it in your introduction, that it's now the Gaza in its 14th consecutive year of, of uh, under a blockade. <laughs> and and uh, 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 during the 10, 11 days of offensive, Gaza was sealed, borders were completely closed. It, after, uh, when a ceasefire was uh, 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 reached, uh, the Kerem Shalom, three or four days later, was very partially opened, uh, but still industrial diesel uh, is not allowed yet to enter Gaza, which is uh, uh, how, how uh, the, the electricity plant could, could function. Uh, so we have a problem uh, of that. So electric, cuts of electricity means that other, other services are in, in real uh, jeopardy, in, in, uh, in a very tough uh, uh, situation. Uh, so uh, municipalities now pump the untreated water to the sea. Uh, um, they're, they're, they cannot treat uh, 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 water uh, because of uh, lack of electricity and as well as industrial diesel. Uh, um, more than 36,000 36, of donums, uh, agricultural donums have been uh, 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 damaged and many, you know, uh, uh, Greenhouses and uh, animal farms have been also uh, uh, affected and, and destroyed. Uh, 70, 70 uh, uh, wells has been also uh, destroyed, uh, and and uh, many many other issues. I hope that we have time to address. But the situation is is really uh, 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 very 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 difficult nowadays. Uh, we have figures regarding uh, schools. Uh, 24 uh, healthcare clinics and hospitals have been uh, uh, affected, uh, destroyed partially or, or totally, according to uh, WHO figures. Uh, significant damage uh, uh, has been uh, resulted in a Rimal clinic uh, on 17th of May, which is the housing of main COVID-19 laboratory, injuring two of two healthcare workers, including severe injury of Dr. Who, who is now in, in the ICU. Uh, uh, 127 schools have been either partially or totally destroyed. Um, streets uh, um, in, in Gaza City, some 76 uh, streets have been uh, uh, damaged, uh, which amount to 120 square uh, uh, kilometers of of uh, of uh, destruction in general, all streets in Gaza. So this is in a nutshell the the how it is now. It's it's. I mean, if you just imagine the situation with the fact that Gaza under this blockade for years, uh, then uh, uh, without any hope that it might be uh, fixed very soon, it's it's really devastating and and in in a very uh, difficult time. Thank you. And I, I want you to know that while you're talking, I think my colleagues are putting a lot of the reports from Al-Mezan and other sources into the chat box so people can, can reference those, look, look into them more deeply. So thank you. I know this is not a lot of time to give a lot of information. Tanya, so uh, turning to you, Isam has drawn a very bleak picture of the situation inside God, the Gaza Strip today. Before we segue to talking about current needs and reconstruction, I want to remind people that even before this latest round of violence, life in the Gaza Strip was not normal, quote unquote, by any standard um, due to the years of blockade and the cumulative impact of previous rounds of destruction, all of which Isam has referred to. Can you talk about what this non-normal status quo ante looked like in the Gaza Strip? And given that we are talking here about more than a decade of blockade and multiple rounds of destruction, can you just talk a little bit about the Israeli policy and strategy that underlines this non-normal status quo? Okay, I will do my best in a short amount of time. But yes, like you said, I think that there is a lot, there are a lot of resources out there and um, 
I want to thank uh, FMEP for holding this important conversation and, and also agree with Isam. It's a real honor um, to, to be here alongside Isam. Um, Mizan and Isha work um, closely together. Um, so, you know, I, I think that um, what's important to keep in mind is that even outside of the hostilities and when Gaza disappears from your front pages, um, there's really what I would call ongoing warfare um, on the Strip, whether that is physical in terms of smaller military operations, uh, incursions often into the Strip, um, attacks on fishermen and farmers, um, but also things like bureaucratic violence, economic uh, warfare um, that we are addressing in our day-to-day -day work. Um, and it's really been a deliberate strategy on Israel's part to push Gaza to the brink. Movement restrictions in particular, which is what we address at, at, at Gisha, have been in place, for example, for decades, um, but they got much, much worse uh, in 2006 when Hamas won uh, parliamentary elections across Palestine, and then of course came to power inside of Gaza in 2007. And the idea has really been to apply pressure for political gain. Security, of course, is a factor, but it has very, very little to do with the policy as we know it overall. Um, in 2007, Israel even called its policy one of economic warfare. The idea was to allow aid, um, but not development. So to deliberately block um, ec economic activity, development of infrastructure, things like family life, not because there were actual security gains to be made from this, but as an overall strategy of pressure. And over time, what we've seen is that some elements of policy have changed um, as a result of outside pressure, um, but also a kind of strategy on Israel's part to uh, preserve what it calls quiet. So I would say that is the quiet that it feels like here inside of Israel or the quiet on your front, uh, your, the front of your newspapers, but it's really never quiet in Gaza. Um, but overall, even despite those policy changes, uh, the policy remains the same. Um, Israel doesn't see itself as owing obligations to Gaza. Um, particularly since the 2005 disengagement, it imposes collective punishment, it blocks access very sweepingly, um, and, and, and it does that with, with total impunity. Um, I would say also importantly, we can't disconnect what's happening in Gaza from a kind of broader strategy of isolating Palestinians one from another and, and trying to undermine political power in Palestine. So I think movement restrictions, these policies of pressure also have very much to do with the, the broader picture and what you're seeing happening in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, um, and even inside of Israel against Palestinian communities here. So again, it's my own nutshell um, to a very big question. Thank you. And I, I listen to you and I find myself, if phrases coming to mind like mowing the lawn, you know, the Israeli policy of essentially with each of these military engagements sort of knocking the whole area back far enough that it's too busy recovering for a while until they have to go in and mow the lawn. That's actually a technical term used. Um, and maybe later on in one of the questions you can talk about the, the now, um, now ended policy of limiting the calories coming into Gaza, which um, I referenced that once in a, uh, a an academic in, a conversation I was having, and someone accused me of making it up and being an anti semite. It was it was quite quite striking. Um, so thank you. So um, okay, so Isam, I want to come back to you. I'm going to ask you a two part question, and again, we're let's try, we're trying to get through a lot. So if we can sort of be sharp. So first of all, we're talking about reconstruction now. We tend to focus the reconstruction on urgent humanitarian needs. So first, what are those most urgent humanitarian needs today. And second, this is maybe the bigger question. I want you to talk about the whole concept of reconstruction and what that term even means, given the dynamics of Israel's blockade of Gaza. And do you think this recurrent framing adopted by the international community of focusing on international intervention to address the immediate humanitarian needs after another round of destruction and seeking to reconstruct Palestinian life to something like status quo ante, is appropriate or sufficient uh, to, or, or even legally what is required? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, I think, uh, again, we should put things in the context and to, to, to the blockade, what does it mean? It's, it's beyond being only a collective punishment. There is a process of de-development as if you are taking Gaza and throw it backwards 60 or 70 years. So there is a complete sieging of the future for all 
uh, nation and then whom to blame again the victim the people who to blame because maybe they voted for the wrong uh, uh, option for uh, and that's why they have to be the consequence and you know the worst thing and the most serious thing when it comes to human communities human beings is this way of uh, 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 experimental approach, if you like. I mean, let's try locate, let's try reconstruct GRM, let's try the Gaza reconstruction mechanism, let's try this and that. Uh, it's quite costly and and uh, would not lead to any anywhere except for more more uh, misery uh, on on the community and and uh, uh, being further there any time uh, uh, to achieve the minimum requirements for for justice. So. The Israelis, I believe, the, the, the Israeli government has done its best since 1993 to transfer the Palestinians from being a nation to communities. Community of Gaza, community of Jerusalem. Gaza is uh, overdrawn uh, with its problems, electricity access, Jerusalem with Arnona and the discriminatory laws and license buildings, south of West Bank, uh, settlements, and center violence, you know, as if it's, it's, it's uh, very disconnected. And Gaza with the blockade have been intentionally created to be humanitarian case. And the crisis is being deepened. Every offensive, we have a deep crisis. And I, I mentioned the figure, 85% of Gaza uh, families are dependent on humanitarian aid. And by the way, the Gazans, the composition of, of the bulk of the community are less than 60%, are less than the age of 30. They're quite active, well-educated, all of them educated. And, and our private sector is, is also quite active. They were, they were they never given the chance to invest or to work or 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 to be part of of their of their society so gaza is, is has been created to be a humanitarian case which is pure political case and should be addressed that way because it's a human made if you're talking about it's not haiti it's not uh, you know an earthquake that hit gaza or a volcano the, the blockade has its dynamics on everything and there is the speakable and the unspeakable I mean, the unspeakable never been touched. These changes on the social fabric. One could, I mean, maybe someday we could we could talk about this. But let's be honest that it's it's quite quite serious. So the humanitarian situation is almost collapsing. Is almost collapsing everywhere. Drinking water, Gaza is uninhabitable, according to a UN report. That by 2020 is a year where Gaza will not be uh, uh, good to to or, or to be anyone could inhabit there. And drinking water is, 95% of Gaza drinking water is polluted. And uh, polluted with nitrate or with bacteria. And, and you can imagine, this is the When it comes to other services, it's, it's, it's also disastrous. Uh, and without it, this time, uh, which is the moment of the truth, without addressing things as they are, I think the worst is, is yet to come. And that's why we say, I mean, the whole reconstruction mechanism it should be should, should be stop this way of dealing with again with the human societies with the human communities because this anthropological way by imposing closure for example over Gaza a blockade and the whole idea was I believe that you know the people of Gaza will suffer and then when they ask themselves why this happened to us it's not because of the Israeli army that imposed it it's because of Hamas and they will go out revolt and Hamas is dead, and for it to love Zika. Very, very anthropological, naive way. And Hamas in power now for its 14 consecutive years. Yesterday was the, the uh, commemorating the 14 years of Hamas uh, in ruling Gaza. Uh, uh, so the whole, the whole way of addressing this should be this time different. The, the key word in the occupied territories, in Gaza, as well as in the rest of the occupied territories, is accountability, which will be addressed maybe later on this, this uh, uh, on this, in our meeting, in our uh, webinar today. But this is the main issue. So humanitarian needs are everything there. What people is really uh, this time want is to, to change the basics of the, the rules of the game. Uh, uh, you cannot destroy and, and reconstruct. Uh, uh, you cannot impose blockade and deal with the, with the consequences. The dynamics are quite serious. And, and, and one should this time just look deep on, on, the, on, 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 those, on those dynamics. So when it comes to what, what Gaza needs, it's, it's, it's created now. It's, it's a business. It's an industry of creating a humanitarian case. 
And I remember one of the diplomats once asked me, you Palestinians get the maximum amount of money per capita in, in a humanitarian aid, international humanitarian aid. And she wants to know uh, uh, what we did as Palestinians with this money. So I get smiled, I told her, look, you will keep sending money as long as Israel is on the other side. As long as, but if our enemy is somewhere else in Africa, then we are dead. So th this is very, very utilitarian way of approaching the problem. This should be stopped unless principles to be employed, international law, law to be employed this time, I think will we'll go nowhere. I mean, through three decades of give peace a chance has resulted in four wars in less than 12 years. It's too much for such a community, children. And, and um, I mean, for me, it's good that I speak. It's sort of psychotherapy for me. But for the community who are now, even the term trauma or post-trauma is not at all uh, uh, an issue here, a repetitive, ongoing, and continuous aggression and trauma. You, have, you are talking about something different. So you could imagine the kind of infrastructure. Imagine someone, his home was destroyed in the year 2009 by the Israeli uh, uh, war jets, and he reconstructed. In the year 2012, again was destroyed. And in the year 2014, a family member was killed. And he is further than any time to achieve the minimum requirements for justice. No reparation, no redress. I mean, how come we, we leave a whole community this way uh, without, without real engagement on the basis of, of rules of justice, rules of international law, to put an end for, for, for this misery? It's quite costly for the international community, but they should stop this way. They are paying the bill of the, of the occupation by tolerating the blockade. So money could be saved, taxpayers' money could be saved, and could be sent to Syria, Yemen, Libya, uh, uh, we can manage. I mean, if we got the chance as private sector and our community, then, I mean, I think the situation definitely will, will be uh, uh, different. So the needs, every, I mean, society is collapsing and, and, and the blockade has, has impoverished and, and you know, bulldozed the, the, the whole, the whole uh, uh, society. Thank you. I, I, incredibly powerful. And there's, there's so much to sort of um, dig more into. And I want to come back to the, the de-development question later on. But I think you really, you sort of skipped ahead to what I, what is I think the, the meat of this, which is, you know, how do you, reconstructing for the sake of a temporary reconstruction that you know is going to be demolished while there's actual de-development going on because of blockade, it, 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 there's something nonsensical about it. We're going to get to that in a minute. Tanya, I want to come back to you and ask you, as someone who's working, again, much like Isam on the ground, can you talk about the urgent issues as you see them in the wake of this 11 day bombardment of Gaza, the things you're being asked to do, you know, ask for help on as, as sort of a metric of what is the most urgent. And also, can you just update the audience um, on what is happening in terms of crossings into and out of Gaza? What is getting in? You know, are people being allowed to cross in or out? And, and what are the Israeli policies um, determining that? Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talked about how things are nor not normal outside of the operations. And I would say that we're not even now back to the regular not normal. We're still in a, a very um, bad situation. Um, like we said, it's been almost a month since the operation ended. Um, but apparently the terms of the ceasefire are still being negotiated. And in the meantime, Israel is, is continuing to apply pressure um, by taking a number of measures that have to do with access in particular, and again, are probably not making it <laughs> to your media outlets. You probably don't know a lot about it, but we're talking about in addition to the two weeks of the operation itself and some measures before, plus now almost um, a month uh, after the operation, um, things like the only uh, commercial goods crossing for Gaza, um, still being closed to all exit of goods. We just spoke today to a textile factory owner who had to, um, uh, you know, temporarily put on leave 300 workers um, because he can't get his goods out to market. Um, Karim Shalom was also closed still for raw materials, um, for construction materials. Um, at, at Erez Crossing, which is the pedestrian crossing that connects Gaza with Israel, with the West Bank, um, only urgent medical patients uh, are getting out after exposure that Israel was blocking cancer patients because it didn't consider cancer treatments to be life-saving. Um, Israel is now allowing out a trickle of uh, cancer patients and other medical patients. But we're talking about a 
a, a, a very, very stringent policy, again, that meets, you know, um, 14 years of, of closure. Um, the coronavirus closure um, that was imposed in March of 2020 was, was still not lifted before this escalation. But even the, 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 you know, the small numbers of people who are getting out before the escalation are not getting out. Um, the fishing zone still limited to six nautical miles. So um, we're talking about a number of measures that have been taken that are just exacerbating the situation. We're being asked by people, um, uh, you know, to 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 basically, you know, put this information out into the world. We're talking about normal people, um, civilians being punished for actions that are outside of their control. We're talking about prices that are going up um, on the market inside of Gaza. Um, you know, uh, um, and really an intolerable situation. So I would say that for us, the immediate concern is to get the crossings reopened, um, at least to the status that they were before the escalation, and then rapidly opened in a fashion that would allow for not just reconstruction in the narrow sense that we think of it, but, but you know, human dignity, um, normal life, um, and, and really everything that civilians need. There's really no excuse to continue this policy. All right, so now that is that is a really helpful both of you update on what's happening. So let's pivot to reconstruction. Let's, sticking with you, Tanya, before we dive too deep into a conversation about frameworks of reconstruction, Yisam has already mentioned the Gaza reconstruction um, mechanism, GRM, you'll be hearing that term a lot for the rest of this webinar. Can you tell us what you understand is happening in terms of reconstruction talks? Who is involved? What are the defining features of what's being discussed? You know, timeframes, anything you can share? Yeah. Um, so what we understand is that reconstruction, like these other elements of policy I just mentioned, are basically under negotiation. Um, they're being negotiated as part of the ceasefire arrangements with the international community, instead of being seen really as a basic right. I mean, it, construction materials, especially after the kind of devastation we saw in this last escalation, not to mention the escalations before, is a basic, essential um, humanitarian uh, you know, product. You, you cannot prevent them from getting in. Um, they need to come in really, really critically. Um, so right now, what we understand is that there are, are discussions with the international community about um, reconfiguring um, a mechanism for allowing these materials to come in in an even more deeply monitored fashion. We can talk about what the GRM is exactly. Um, even though you know everyone knows that armed groups are not relying on um, the official commercial crossing for you know their weaponry, their cash, um, uh, you know their armaments. And so their to cement. me it feels exactly to me it feels like quite a farce. Um, and you know, Israel is managing, I would say, to kind of hijack the conversation and make it one about its own security, um, rather than about you know uh, uh, the needs of, of two million civilians who have just experienced this this devastating assault. And, and I don't think that's by chance. I think that um, while you know, of course, Israel has legitimate security concerns. When you're looking at the Gaza Strip, you cannot only be talking about that. We need to be talking about vital. Um, rebuilding and needs, you know, of the civilian population. Thanks. And you actually mentioned something which um, I think not a lot of people in the audience may understand well, which is e even Israeli security, it, it's not debatable. Hamas and armed groups don't rely on the major crossings for their supplies. They get those in through illicit means. The limitations on cement coming in as a dual use product is fundamentally enriching those who bring it in illicitly um, and not in any way preventing it, the, the people who want cement for other purposes getting what they need. Um, Isam, I wanna come back to you. Talk to us about the role groups like your group, Al Mezan, are playing in this conversation around reconstruction. And, and I guess more broadly, is there a space or a role for Palestinians living in Gaza to actually be part of these discussions, which as Tanya said, are being hijacked as they have been in the past by or, or monopolized by an Israeli conversation about Israel's security needs, as opposed to Gaza's reconstruction, humanitarian, normal life needs. Yes, um, to be honest, uh, uh, what we can do so far, uh, one of the problems is the nothing is transparent, nothing. I mean, we don't know what's going on. <clears throat> Suddenly we could have white smoke and a deal is there, another GRM. 
uh, this is the case. Um, and uh, as Tanya uh, said, I mean, we don't know exactly uh, what kind of engagements, but we 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 could, you know, uh, uh, through our our following up what's what's going on. That uh, still uh, uh, there is a serious deadlock somewhere that Israel is insisting on what it. It, it says it's uh, uh, security, uh, uh, which also was used or abused uh, and in just in justifying the blockade that's imposed over Gaza and the complete failure of the GRM as a mechanism in the aftermath of the uh, uh, offensive in 2014. But we, we're doing our best to rationalize the whole, the whole process and to make uh, whatever information that we have uh, available. We do a lot of advocacy, to be honest, uh, uh, with the different actors, uh, targeting different actors, uh, uh, and, and trying to push all the time uh, for the principles and, and for the rules of, of, of international law, a different engagement, to reconsider the whole engagement with this part of the world. Because so far, international community did not at all uh, intervene uh, to, to, to save not only the, the, the principles, but also to preserve peace and security. Uh, 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 which has been, uh, you know, uh, sacrificed well, uh, for, for very, again, utilitarian uh, uh, interests. And if you, if you just allow me just, I mean, we, if you cut and paste the, our, what we talk now, what we are talking about, to the, in the in months, six or seven months after uh, offensive 2014, it's almost the same, same rhetoric, the same way. And I just quote President Carter in his uh, article for the Washington Post uh, on the 26th of March, 2015. He wrote that nearly seven months after the end of the latest war on, in Gaza, none of the underlying causes of the conflict have been addressed. In the meantime, the people of Gaza are experiencing unprecedented levels of deprivation and the prospects for renewed armed conflict is very real. It's, it's almost the same. It's almost the same. And, and, and many has uh, contributed and, and wrote in this. For example, the, the, the Human Rights Committee in, in 2000, uh, 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 sorry, the ICRC in 2010, they, they, they published something and, uh, regarding the blockade over Gaza. To see the blockade, the blockade is not just a security tool. It's, it's punishing the whole nation, which is not, I mean, you cannot imagine the dynamics of this. When I left my, my, my office and went home at 3 p.m. Gaza just to, to get prepared for, for this webinar, I discovered that it's our, it's our turn now to have electricity at 3 in the, where I live. It's if, uh, I live in the uh, fifth, fifth floor. There was no electricity, so I have to go to the fifth floor. I'm, I'm a cancer survivor and I, I cannot go by feet. It's really difficult. So I need to go by, by, by the elevator. There is no, no, I cannot bring the food stuff that I brought with me because there is no electricity. The interfering in the different aspects of our daily life. It's not only the cement, the construction, it's everywhere. Cancer patients cannot pursue their medication. There is no single radiotherapy system in Gaza, which is a must in, the, in case of cancer patients. The only way is to transfer patients to, to, the, to, to Augusta Victoria Hospital in Jerusalem or to hospitals inside Israel or the West Bank. And then imagine that uh, it, it might take time. And uh, in the year, which I mean, in the article that was distributed, I just put it on the chat. Uh, uh, the, the, in, in the year 2017, at least 11,000 medical appointments due to either the Israeli authorities' rejection of their request, not responding to them in a timely manner, or not responding to them at all. Ultimately, this led to the death of 40, 43 Palestinians, including three, three children and 17 women in the same year. We are not talking about an offensive here. 2017, 11,000 medical appointments and people are being referred outside Gaza because there is almost a collapse of the of the health infrastructure here. So th th that's why I mean this time the whole engagement engagement should be different. But the ICRC in, in what they published they said the whole of Gaza civilian population is being punished for acts for which they bear no responsibility. The closure therefore constitute a collective punishment imposed in clear violation 
of Israel's obligation under international humanitarian law. The closure is having devastating impact on the 1.5 million of that time people living in Gaza. Those are the dynamics of it, okay. It's, it's without addressing this, the root causes of the issue. I think it, it, it would add more uh, uh, burden and more misery on, on the community. And, and I, I don't imagine, I cannot imagine a process of reconstruction could, could go on to alleviate uh, uh, not only the consequences of the of the 11 days, but the, the deep crisis that's there in that in the construction sector, there is a very need. There is, I mean, uh, there's a shortage in housing units for newly married uh, uh, couples or, or for the community that we have an initial increase of 2.7% up to 3%. So you need, you need construction material. So Hamas, uh, might get the material as the Israelis would claim the army, but also Hamas, whatever, they, they, they could also, I mean, they could also, uh, 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 you know, they drink milk, they eat tomato. Uh, uh, so, I mean, then they could stop everything that comes to Gaza because uh, no, no mechanism there to ensure that those products, whether dairy products or vegetables could go to Hamas. Can we punish a whole nation that they have nothing to do whatsoever of the whole process uh, uh, and, 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 and punish them and not to live as, 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 as normal? The basics that they need for a society that's increasing dramatically and uh, uh, it's just, just to say. So we, we try to rationalize this and it's time to address international law. Sometimes we feel that you, we are utopian because we are the only people in town who speaks this. Uh, uh, while, while civilized nations have put those principles, and I believe it's still valid and should be addressed here. I don't care, Hamas, the Israelis, they finish their business with each other, but the community, the 2.2 million, how come they, they, they live for 14 years under unprecedented blockade? And then whom to, to blame? I remember Richie Corey when was killed, the American activist in Rafah in 2003, when she protested the, 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 the destroying of, of homes in Rafah. She was killed by an, an, an army bulldozer at that time. The, 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 the army in a later stage said that she has to be blamed because she was in the wrong time and place. And again, blaming the victim, blaming Gazans for the blockade, blaming uh, whoever. I mean, it's, it's too much to, to accept it. And I think it's why this time international community should uh, intervene and consider things uh, very different, differently, not only, I mean, international community, but also the United Nations. Has, has a moral and legal duty this time to ensure that uh, uh, the process, or pro I mean, at least the blockade to be lifted and to deal with the root causes of it. Thank you. That's uh, you, amazing. You cover so much. I, and I think you really are highlighting for people fundamentally, this is a question of if you're gonna talk about reconstruction of Gaza and not deal with collective punishment, not deal with blockade, which is what has happened in the past, then then you're not actually dealing with the situation. You are. It, it's, palliative and short term and, and really um, a, a deeply flawed approach. Tanya, I want to come back to you and I want to now dig in a little bit to the Gaza reconstruction me uh, mechanism. And this is, some of this is just technical. Uh, for folks on the call who don't know exactly what it is, can you describe what it is? Obviously this, this dates back to the, the last war. Um, describe what its failings are as you see them. Um, and, and I actually, I mean, maybe talk a little bit about whether or not you see any chance of it being different this time, since you've already said the process is being largely hijacked um, by the same, the same dynamic. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to really try not to dig in too deep and get too technical because I'm afraid we'll chase um, people away. Um, but, but I do think it's, it's important to note that, you know, the Gaza reconstruction mechanism, the GRM, it was conceived of um, after the 2014 operation. And the idea was that it would monitor um, the entry of gravel, cement, and steel, which are the basic building blocks of you know, any, any construction, as well as other items that Israel considered dual use. Now, um, as people you know, watching this might realize, gravel and cement and steel, they are not dual use items in any other place in the world. There are agreed international standards for items that are dual use. These items are not dual use. And a lot of um, the items that are being blocked from coming into Gaza are not dual use in any other part of the world. We're talking about 
um, batteries that are needed. Um, we're talking about epoxy glue, resins, um, like a, a very, very long list of items, all communications equipment. That's actually one of the items on the list is, is communications equipment. So you can imagine hundreds, if not thousands of items falling under that category. So I would say, you know, the GRM, um, you know, as it was conceived was problematic, but really you need to also zoom out and look at Israel's concept of what is considered um, dual use. So. Um, the GRM basically tries or sets out to monitor the entrance of these items. Um, you have a few different streams of the GRM, whether that's for rebuilding of homes or for larger projects, usually run by international organizations. Um, Israel uh, has a say to approve all of the contractors, all of the vendors. When it comes to these big projects, we're talking about Israel um, having oversight over the building plans, the location of the project. And then over every single, um, again, dual use item um, that is needed for that project. So on the bigger projects, it could literally be thousands of items and the UN needs to monitor that those items um, come in and go to their destination. Um, you have you know, major problems, again, not just with the GRM, with the dual use policy as a whole, where Israel will decide at a whim, uh, essentially that a certain item can't be let in at all. And, and going back to your question about what is really urgently needed, um, already in, in January of this year, we heard about a, a sudden complete ban on steel pipes coming into the Gaza Strip. And steel pipes, what do you know, are needed for the water, uh, the, the water sector. Um, with Isam mentioning the kind of destruction that has occurred in the, in the water sector, you know, we were speaking with the water authorities, they can't repair um, sewage treatment and water infrastructure that would be providing um, services to civilians because of this total ban. So you have on the one hand, the GRM, which is ostensibly set up to monitor the entrance of equipment like steel pipes, and then Israel making a decision, we're just not gonna allow it in at all. And that is something that we've seen on a recurring basis. Um, requests for items not being uh, answered, being denied without any explanation, um, lots of delays in a situation where things are needed urgently, where there isn't a lot of you know, extra funds for, for um, compensating for these delays. So I think that um, you know, this GRM, which was really meant to be temporary after this military, the, the 2014 military operation has really turned into de facto the mechanism for bringing in a range of items um, which are, are vastly civilian in nature, again, and urgently needed by the population. So I think that I agree very much with talking about root causes, kind of tinkering with this mechanism when the mechanism itself wasn't the actual problem in terms of, of security infractions and breaches. It is really beside the point. It's really, um, it, you know, just completely irrelevant. So I, I would encourage, you know, people to, to rethink um, this mechanism to rethink the dual use monitoring as a whole. Um, I, I would say it's not about security. It's very much about what I talked about before, about applying pressure, uh, about uh, extensive control, and also about control without responsibility. Israel is on the one hand reserving its right to monitor every single item that comes into Gaza, where buildings are going up in the strip. And yet at the same time, it's saying we have no responsibility for the civilian population. So, you know, in a sense, choose, choose what you want. You can't have control without having responsibility. Um, and, and for Israel to actually have that responsibility and bear that responsibility, there needs to be greater action by the uh, international community. Um, the impunity that's in place now for everything from these small um, things like not allowing reconstruction to, to go forward to the bigger picture of these escalations and war crimes committed in the, in the framework of these escalations is is fueled and 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 accelerated by impunity. Yeah, I, I was in Gaza after the the previous the 2014 war and talking to people on the ground about the GRM and learning about it. It struck me that it it really is an almost Orwellian name. It 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 sounds like the Gaza reconstruction mechanism is there to facilitate um, and speed reconstruction in urgent situation as opposed to actually becoming a bureaucratic obstacle that enables the prevention of reconstruction that would take place in any other context and, and legitimizes it effectively and legitimizes the blockade, which is the overall context for preventing reconstruction. Um, it, it's a really odd, um, it, it's an odd way to name it. Um, 
Isam, I want to come back to you and I want to sort of, we, we're just going to sort of, we have a lot of questions in the queue and I have more questions. We're getting towards the end here. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the problem with this whole framing and I want to come back to that. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time digging into the details of GRM and, and you're welcome to talk about that more. I think that your points are much more important. Um, the necessity of shifting the, the framework altogether to accountability, international law, and looking at what are effectively the root causes of the situation on the ground and how you address those. I wanna give you an opportunity to talk more about that and, and to talk about what you think that discussion should look like. You've already said international law should be the basis, right? But, but what should that look at? I mean, the international community looks at Gaza and says, okay, we don't have an answer for the Israeli-Palestinian crisis right now, right? The, Israeli, the conflict, which again, we've learned now is a really impoverished word to describe the Israeli-Palestinian situation, but you have this unresolved situation between Israelis, Israel and the Palestinians in all these different communities, as you've described it, which are now atomized. Well, we don't have a solution to that, but how do we in that context help Gaza in a way that does not bolster and strengthen the underlying um, structures uh, that exist today? Well, um, again, um, the, the, the context is important and to conduct sort of autopsy of the uh, uh, rules of the different actors is important to see why we have reached this, this end. But before I add this, this, let me just highlight the GRM, if I have uh, two, two minutes on this. The GRM, which is supposed to be temporary, as, as uh, Tanya said, uh, and, and uh, was, was uh, uh, intended to, 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 uh, uh, to facilitate the entry of the material to, to, uh, uh, to Gaza, items classified and treated as dual use. The, the, the mechanism, which I'm afraid might be repeated somehow on this, that was very slow, very bureaucratic, legalized the illegal, legitimizes the illegitimate, talking about the blockade, because it was the, 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 main, the main issue at, uh, uh, then and now. And, and uh, uh, there was no ac accountability mechanism in this. And I, I have something uh, just to, that sum up the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the mechanism and how bureaucratic it is in, in a, a policy briefing by Sultan Barakat and Firas Masri uh, 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 for the Brookings Doha Center. They said that a look at the approval process gives a glimpse into the large amount of bureaucracy created by the GRM, which practically explains the, the lag. Before a family in Gaza receives any construction materials, they must go through a multi-step process. First, the PA, Ministry of the Palestinian Ministry of Public Works and Housing completes a survey of the damage to the homes. The assessment includes the amount of damage incurred as well as the amount and type of building materials required for a particular reconstruction uh, uh, reconstruction project. And, and it then uploads the assessment to the, to the joint COGAT, COGAT, which is the Israeli uh, uh, part, PA and the UN database established under the GRM. The PA submits the assessment. Imagine this process. The PA, the PA submits, submits the assessment to the high level steering team comprised of representatives of COGAT, the PA and the UN. At, at this point, COGAT can either approve or veto the assessment. After the approval process, the HLST, which is the high level steering team, then provides the beneficiary with coupons, giving them permission to purchase construction materials from approved donor uh, vendors. This authorization process must be completed for each step of construction, including laying a house's foundation, framing, plastering, and finishing works. They have to go all, all in each period of this should go into this process. This, this is part of how, how bureaucratic it is. Structural issues with the GRM arrangements complicate, compl complicate and already uh, cumbersome process, the database which governs the approval process, it run not by authorities in Gaza, but by the PA in the, um, uh, in the West Bank, some 160 kilometers from the commercial good entry point at Kerem Shalom. Another one of the PA's duties is to funnel money uh, uh, to reconstruct through construction efforts through the Ministry of Finance. This is how it works. 
It's very bureaucratic, not transparent. Israel have the ultimate say on this. It can easily ban or 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 not banning this. Back to to your. I actually just want to. It's like, so I mean, again, I don't think people really understand the GRM. This is a this is a system that was supposed to have been set up ostensibly to help reconstruction, yes. which effectively gives Israel the ability to veto reconstruction of individual homes. And I, I think this is an important thing to emphasize because most people, I think, really do believe that Israel is out of Gaza, yeah. Um, yeah. even though even though effectively in many ways it, it is very much in Gaza and controls the the areas around it. I'm sorry. So continue. Yes. Uh, uh, back to the uh, uh, to the to the point, which is sort of the way out. Uh, and I think the, this time we have to address accountability uh, differently because it's the key word. And by the way, accountability, is, is, it's not only Israel that's not accountable. All parties are not accountable. Hamas is only accountable to Hamas. The PA, in the absence of the Palestinian Legislative Council and the undermining of oversight mechanisms, etc., the PA might be accountable to donors. No one is accountable to the people. Israel is not accountable on its, on its practices. And this could give you a sort of why Israel executed four offenses for aggressions over Gaza in the last 12, 12 years, because they, they, they feel that they are un, 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 unaccountable. And, and uh, uh, they did not allow, I'm talking about the ICC, for example, forget about the ICC. The special rapporteur of the United Nations is not allowed to visit the occupied territory. Uh, Fact-finding missions are not allowed. Human rights watch may be not allowed. Amnesty is, are, are not allowed. So, I mean, as long as the, 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 the state is feeling that is, is above the law, enjoys this impunity, definitely the scenario might be repeated. And, and accountability here is a key word. Can international community tolerate this? Tax buyers to be all the time, Israel destroys and, and they reconstruct three decades of good peace and chance, the point that I raised, while they were watching that create facts that are being created, irreversible facts on the ground. The number of settlers on the eve of Oslo were 100,000. Now we are approaching the 700,000 and very soon will be 1 million in the heart of the occupied territories. And part of the international community spent two decades debating the labeling of settlements as if it's the problem. The problem is the, the settlements. And, and, and why settlements? Because it's, first of all, it's illegal according to international law. And second, how to preserve the two-state solution if we still back the two-state solution. It's a moment of the truth. That's why I, I, when approaching the United States or, or other actors, I think they are not doing any good by, for Israel by tolerating this. Nothing. I mean, the, the feeling of that you're humiliated that that this you are you are under this very very process of fragmentation the geography and the demography no single student from gaza could study in in in, in, in ramallah in the other you know according to oslo oslo did not identify the territories to be occupied but at least it has recognized the territories to be one territorial unity and its integrity to be preserved in theory in practice no single student could, could pursue higher education in the West Bank. And tell me, it has anything to do with, with security? No, it has to, de, to do with the, this vision of, you know, fragmenting the territories, fragmenting the geography. I studied at Mir Zayt University in Ramallah when I was, I mean, in the 80s. And we used to be 35% of the overall number of students of the university from Gaza. Now it's zero students. One should go to those details. It's beyond being a, 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 a matter of security. It's as as Tanya, Tanya said. It's it's more to inf inflict pressure on on the community and to transfer Palestinians into community Gazans to be drawn with its problems, access and you know sewage system, fishing, uh, uh, and and this stuff and and other communities they have their, their own problems. So it's again it's a moment of the truth to reconsider accountability seriously, because this would, would put an end for the repetition of, of uh, 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 this, this destruction, reconstruction process and money. Uh, uh, you know, donors uh, or some actors, uh, how they contribute to peace is by sending parcels of food to Gaza or by sending money to the occupied territories, to the PA. 
it's good. They occupy territories in need for their, their support. But, but I mean, you cannot stuck on, on that role, the role of the donor. International community this time should apply pressure to put an end for this. For example, the, the, the blockade is the source of the problems. It's a human made crisis in Gaza. So let's, let's now address it as it is. Any mechanism that would keep or legalize the blockade will be illegal by the end of the day and, and would not serve those good intentions by, by international community to reconstruct Gaza and to put an end for this humanitarian crisis. Thank you. Um, I, I want to, okay, so we've covered a lot and we've covered a lot of the questions that were in the queue already. Tanya, I wanna, I think, end with a question to you. Um, so coming out of this latest round of destruction, we have a new Israeli government at this moment. We have a relatively new administration in Washington, lots of hope around both of those things. What kind of pressure do you think is needed um, on Israel to change its policies? What kind of role does the international community have to take that's different in order to not simply continue down this well-worn road of continued collective punishment legitimized by the outside world as we wait for the next round of destruction? And does the fact that we do have a new government in Israel offer any hope to you at all for that? I, I wish I could say that it did, because um, I, I like to be an optimistic person. People who, who know me know that. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't hold my breath. I think that we still have a lot of work to do, and I'm glad for this kind of call, because I think that that's, that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about kind of people power and, and you know, how we hold our, our leaders um, and our governments accountable. Um, I think I, I, I want to say that I really share um, Isam's, um, you know, message about accountability and accountability, you know, is a big word and, and, and I don't think we need to wait to see what happens at the ICC and these kind of processes that will take a long time. I think accountability is in everything from the day to day, you know, all, all the way up to the top and the kind of bigger questions of justice and and what happens going forward. Um, and I think that if we start to think about right now, today, many things can change on the ground that will provide greater dignity, um, greater hope, um, greater well being to individuals, then we're not so overwhelmed by the bigger questions and the conflict and these sorts of, of things that are that are, you know, I think overwhelmingly kind of blown up to, to seem more complex than they are. I don't think it's so complex at all, but I think that that kind of bringing it down to the fact that the things that are happening today are unacceptable is a way to kind of start working on things um, and, and for people not to be uh, deterred by, by how big the problems are. Um, I do wanna say that I think the US role um, is huge. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I mentioned that it took, you know, Biden 10 days to kind of even utter the word ceasefire. And that was a huge green light to Israel. Every day on the news, you had the newscasters talking about the fact that the U.S. was behind us um, and that that encouraged Israel to go forward. And the minute there was greater discussion about the ceasefire, Israel felt pressured. Um, I also want to add that members of Congress speaking out about what was happening and drawing these bigger conclusions, not framing things just as a humanitarian crisis, not framing things just as being problematic because right now there's an escalation. That was heard inside of Israel. And I think the kind of greater connections being made to human rights, to dignity, um, to oppressions worldwide, I think is having an impact. And I think it'll also change the way that the current Israeli government and future Israeli governments will operate. So again, I wanna encourage people who are engaged on this issue to continue working on it because it, it, it's working. And I think um, Isam is very um, much right that, that this is a moment of truth. And I think the moment is whether we break open what has happened, Pal Palestinian issues, Palestinian human rights in a way have gone more mainstream than they ever were. We're not fighting an uphill battle as we did 10 years ago to explain to people why you know, the closure of Gaza is wrong. People know. And I think that what we need to be asking ourselves is in you know, 2021, are we, um, are we okay with this policy that punishes civilians for acts they didn't commit? And if we're okay with it and we're not doing enough to change it, who are we? What, what does that make us? And, and those are the questions that we're working you know, on compelling our own government and our own people to ask themselves. But I think very much the international community is embroiled in this. 
and they have a responsibility as well to ask those important questions. Thanks. And Isama, I want to give you the last word. I want to circle back to you in this question of Palestinians living in Gaza, having a say and being heard because these are their lives, right? You know, it's, I feel like people need to be reminded and maybe we're getting more. So that's changing a little bit with Twitter and Facebook where you actually see faces and hear voices from Gaza more, which is amazing. But I want to ask you if you feel comfortable, you know, if given the chance, imagine right now, you have a chance in this speaking, you're speaking to European policymakers, US policymakers, the UN. What would Palestinians living in Gaza as private individuals, citizens facing now years of collective punishment blockade and facing a world which is saying, listen, we're generous with, your aid, with our aid, you should be thanking us. What, is, what would they say? I mean, I know they would say, some of that is thank you. I've heard that when I'm in Gaza, we appreciate that you keep sending us food, but there's the rest of that what they would say. And, and can you articulate that a little bit for, the, for, for, for our audience? Well, it's a very tough question uh, because uh, uh, when it comes to Gaza, I think it's, it's very easy to predict what the people could go for. Uh, people fed up with, the, with uh, this illusion that, for example, the peace process could go on and go to its intended end without being based on rules of, of, of of a reference that's acceptable, which is rules of international law. I highlight rules of international law because those are the rules that civilized nations have, have accepted and Palestinians consider themselves part of the civilized nations and, and to go for that. And I think the message is clear. This time, you should stop playing this role of uh, uh, backing uh, whatever processes, while uh, you sacrifice with the principles. This is one. Second, uh, uh, Palestinians are not, uh, could, I mean, the, 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 the Palestinian question cannot be, you know, sum up with the, this idea of a state. Without a rights-based approach to the conflict, again, the scenario will, will be, will be uh, repeated. And, and international community should stop this, uh, this way of, uh, uh, you know, dealing with this part of the world. Uh, it's a time where uh, money to be saved and pressure to be uh, employed uh, 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 to preserve, I mean, the, what they back so far, the two-state solution, which I think, I mean, it, it, we are in, 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 I mean, we don't have time even. Uh, uh, for the two-state solution, because Israel intentionally has created facts to make it mission impossible. When they disengage from Gaza, the whole rationale behind this engagement is to kill the unity of the territories and to isolate Gaza as prerequisite for the killing of the two-state solution. So it's the time to reconsider this. And I think, the re I mean, extremism is the recipe of isolation. Gaza should be engaged well and Palestinian reconciliation process to be supported by international community and on top of them, the United States. Because it's, 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 it's important to bring all to the formal political system. It's a moment of truth. Because those who recognized Israel, those who supported the peace process, have been rewarded settlements, have been rewarded you know, isolation, have been rewarded uh, uh, very, very difficult time. Um, I mean, uh, uh, what was intended to be uh, 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 temporary became chronic. Uh, and, and the final issues that, uh, issues that were left to the final status negotiations, for example, I mean, Khalas Fonito, they de facto have settled them down, like Jerusalem, land, water, border, etc. So I think it's, it's, it's now. Uh, a time for a different engagement uh, uh, where Palestinians should enjoy their dignity and national aspirations. Uh, uh, they have the right for their own state, but it's not their, their own, their, the only right for that. Palestinians have their own rights and should be protected. And both the Palestinians and the Israelis have equal rights when it comes to security, to peace. The Israelis have their own security, but also the Palestinians have their own security. And the two should be preserved. There is still hope, and I, I share the, the, uh, the hope of Tanya. I'm still hopeful that uh, uh, there, 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 
the someday we'll 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 overcome all of this. I know now it's really the very difficult for us who work in human rights to convince the people that no, there is still a chance after four wars. I mean, out of 120 cases that we submitted to the relevant authorities in Israel, investigative uh, bodies, 120 cases of the war 2014, talking about serious cases, multi-story buildings destroyed, families were eliminated, you know, out, no single criminal case was opened by the relevant authorities in Gaza, uh, in, 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 in Israel. The army, I'm talking about the, the MAG, the military advocate general. No single case out of the 120. No criminal investigation was open. Closed, the whole files were closed. And then what to do? Have to convince the people that there is still a chance. You are pushing the people. No accountability, no justice, no reparation, no, red, no redress. You, they are pushing the people to the corner. And I'm asking myself where they are taking Gaza to, where are they taking the people to? 60% are less than the age of 30, and they see this humiliation. And by the way, how the people reacted, uh, uh, not only in Gaza, in the two sides of the board of the Green Line, West Bank, regarding what's happening in, 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 in Sheikh Jarrah, it's a matter of dignity. People feel humiliated, were betrayed by international community. It's a time where things should get, go back to the, to the roots, the root causes of the problem. And it's clear, it's, I mean, it doesn't need that much, uh, you know, uh, effort to, 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 to realize this. So it's, it's why we insist on, on this time, on a process that would lead to the end of this. And, and the starting points here, the, to end, end the blockade and to end this, the internal split. And by the way, it looks like it's internal issue because Palestinians are bad, they are divided. No, there are many noses there. Many noses are there. And it's a time to back reconciliation, the process internally, because it's prerequisite for real engagement with, with the international community. I remember when Arafat was alive, Arafat was the head of a terrorist organization, a, a terror symbol in the, in the 70s. And a later, in a later stage, he became a peacemaker a Nobel Prize winner. And then when he refused to accept what has been proposed, he was viewed to be an obstacle to peace. Then he disappeared. And that's why we Palestinians, you are failures because you have this bad guy. And, and then Arafat disappeared, poisoned, killed. And we have all the good boys, all the good boys. And then what they were rewarded, no Palestinian partner, unilateral disengagement from Gaza and complete failure. Of the, of the process. And no one could hear claim that he or she did not hear or see what, what was going on in the occupied territory and what is going on now at, this, at the moment in, in Jerusalem or in the West Bank on daily basis. There are killings and destruction of properties and, you know, uh, and intensifying the blockade. So it's everywhere. So in the West Bank, they don't have rockets, for example. And then what they were rewarded, enclaves and 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 Pontestats everywhere. Jerusalem is being completely isolated, and, and I think it's that's why the, the whole engagement should be different this way. And Gaza should not be isolated anymore. They should engage with Gaza for the sake of of the unity of the territories and the sake of of uh, a potential uh, process that might lead to justice and 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 dignity. Thank you. This was really, really a rich discussion. We had a couple questions show up in the queue on really asking whether or not you're talking about tweaking the GRM or getting rid of it altogether. I don't think we have a lot of time. My sense from both of you is that you don't think the GRM as it sits is particularly constructive as a mechanism. Um, I, I don't know if you want to very quickly either of you weigh in on the question of is it worth is it something that should be saved and and fixed or is it time to move on to something else? I, if you want to answer either of you on this, like two minutes, but I, I want to hold you to two minutes each. Well, I reiterate what I said earlier that the the, the mechanism was complete failure from the early beginning. The starting point was based on a complete failure uh, on not only utilitarian but keeping legalizing the illegal. And, and, and that's why the, the key word again is not only, but also the blockade should be lifted. And you cannot 
keep Gaza to be this largest open prison, while the guards don't have any obligation, any responsibility vis-a-vis -vis their prisoners, their prison, uh, prisoners, yes, in terms of food, medicine, or, or, or etc. So the GRM is not the, the, the mechanism to reconstruct Gaza. Uh, 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 concerns of international community should and could be taken into consideration. I mean, there could be mechanisms, but on the basis of it's not only uh, the flow of construction material to be to enter Gaza, but also the exit from Gaza right. should be also addressed this time. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think the whole the whole mechanism is irrelevant, illegal, and and, and not only the the Israel and the, the United Nations to be part of this this mechanism. It's a violation of the UN law, violation of 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 Vienna Treaty, violation of the Geneva Convention, being part of this illegal process it's illegal period i mean if you go back into the details of the of the uh, the grm it, it it's it's really uh, 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 complete failure and and, and 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 illegal and i believe we 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 should not be you no know, fixed or repaired and, and and i think it's irrelevant at all perfect tanya did you want to add anything I, I just wanted to add that, you know, I agree that you, you, can, you can't tinker or do away with the GRM, though, and leave in place Israel's dual-use policy. That's also not an alternative um, to the situation. So I think that if the GRM is, is, is done away with, then we also need to look more broadly at, at the policy as a whole. And like I said, construction materials are not dual-use any other place in the world, and there's no reason for them to be dual-use in Gaza. Israel also has mechanisms for for monitoring tunnel digging and things like that, that it really doesn't have any justification for this, this sort of disproportionate um, you know, harm that it is being done by restricting entrance of materials. Thank you. All right, so we're going to end that here. Um, I wanna also say that there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A about organizations that you should engage with or follow or support if you wanna be engaged on Gaza. Here, I will recommend Gisha and al Mezan both doing amazing work. Um, and you can look at their partner organizations, uh, look at their websites, you can see the groups they work with. Um, I think that's a really good place for, for people to start. Um, on behalf of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, I want to thank Isam and Tanya so much for participating in our webinar today. And thanks to everyone who joined and especially those who submitted questions. And we will be giving all the questions in writing to both panelists so they'll be able to see what people are asking, what they're interested in. If you wanna learn more about the issues we've been discussing today, follow our guests on Twitter, check out their websites. You, those are all in the chat box and our website, fmep.org, where you'll have all of the resources from today's webinar alongside the video. And I would also say check out our website for upcoming programs and for the latest episodes of our Occupied Thoughts podcast, which we are adding new content to every week. It's terrific. You can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And with that, uh, we will end this. Thank you so much. And I hope we can have you both back again for further conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great honor. Thank you.